Bueno, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Eh, en esta ocasión vamos a hacer el cierre del de trayecto de la educación en debate que forma parte de la Semana Unipe Virtual 2022 y que viene formando parte de las versiones anteriores. En este caso, con una entrevista grabada eh, a través de videoconferencia con la profesora Sonia Livingston, que es profesora del Departamento de Medios y Comunicación de la London School of Economics and Political Science. Su trabajo es una muy influyente vertiente para pensar todo lo que tiene que ver con los estudios de comunicación, educación digital a nivel mundial. Ha escrito más de 20 libros, todos referidos a medios, regulación, educación digital, audiencias y en particular eh, aquello que tiene que ver con los derechos y riesgos de los niños, niñas y adolescentes a raíz de la vida conectada. En la actualidad, eh, Sonia Livingston dirige el proyecto Global Kids Online con UNICEF y la Digital Futures Commission. Ambas tienen que ver justamente con estas cuestiones en las que se cruzan la conectividad con los derechos y los riesgos de niñas, niños y adolescentes. En esta charla que vamos a ver a continuación, que fue eh, trabajada a partir de Patricia Ferrante, quien es la directora del Centro de Educación y Tecnología de la Universidad, vamos a poder asistir a, a sus ideas respecto de los derechos, las expectativas y los miedos de la vida digital de niños, niñas y adolescentes y el rol de la escuela y de los docentes en un mundo que está crecientemente datificado. Así que, bienvenidos y bienvenidas otra vez. Les agradezco que nos acompañen. Le agradezco particularmente a Patricia Ferrante, que se tomó el trabajo de hacer la entrevista y también contribuir con la traducción, y al equipo de laboratorio de medios de nuestra universidad. Uh, well, it's an honor and a great pleasure to share this conversation with Professor Sonia Livingston, a person who is extremely influential in Latin America and, of course, also in Argentina, both in the communication field and the education field. So, uh, Sonia, thank you for being here. And my first question is that you've been researching now for many years uh, how uh, kids and young people connected life is. And uh, what would you say that today are the main expectations and fears about those, those lives? And also, um, you have this uh, rights approach towards researching, researching this more than risk approach. So um, how, how, how would you describe that perspective? Well, thank you uh, so much for uh, inviting me to um, participate. And um, yes, you asked me some questions I've thought about for a long time in my research, um, especially as part of the uh, Global Kids Online project, which includes Argentina, as, I'm, um, as I hope you know. Um, I think from children and young people's perspective, um, lots of consultations really show that for them, this is their life. They haven't known a pre-digital life. They welcome a digital life and they believe that it is, um, it's theirs. It's, it's sort of how they express their agency and feel that they are modern and actors in the world. Of course, they have lots of fears. They see the same science fiction films as everyone else. They, Um, fear that the computers will take over, that big tech will, powerful, you know, technology companies will take over um, and that their agency will be threatened. So for them, you know, technology is really um, a way of, of enjoying and expressing their agency. And uh, they really value it for everything, for learning, for social life, for um, political participation, for getting health information, for exploring their identity, for play, for fun, uh, and so on. I, I see young people increasingly aware that there are risks, that there are problems. Many of them have encountered problems personally, and many have um, seen that other people experience problems. And I think children and young people are very um, moral in the sense that they don't just want to keep themselves safe, but they really do, they hate it when they see other people being badly treated, other people being abused online and a, a hostile culture. So they want it to be um, a better place than it is, than it is now. 
And all of that really fits my um, and many people's adoption of a child rights perspective. So the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child sets out um, children's rights. Um, um, nearly every country has ratified it, including Britain, including Argentina. Uh, and recently, the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, adopted its general comment 25, which says, these are the ways that um, children's rights apply in the digital world. And it captures that sense of agency that is so important to young people. And it captures their desire to be heard, to have a space in which they are effective and uh, can act collectively as well as enjoy their um, rights and their lives individually. So yes, digital technology helps them to learn, helps them to play, helps them to socialize, helps them to participate, but it should also protect them, protect their safety, protect them from commercial exploitation, protect their privacy. And that's where the problems lie because we haven't solved that yet. Okay, uh, I've thought this uh, this question for later, but I'm going to bring it now because I think it uh, it engages with what you have just said. Which uh, do you think that uh, regulations are behind all this that that is happening? Who should regulate and what should be regulated? Um, there's a global problem on regulating the the big platforms, the big tech players. Um, but also how how everybody, not only kids and young people, participate online. Who can regulate that, and is that regula reg regulatable? I, I don't know if that's a word, but I think you understand me. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so everyone has to take responsibility for uh, introducing digital technologies into our lives and making um, our societies dependent upon technologies. The technologies have now become part of the infrastructure. It's really um, not easy to learn without technology, to work without technology, to manage one's daily life without technology. So when the technology moves from being optional, an extra, a luxury, to being necessary and essential, I think at that point the state must take the responsibility to ensure that um, everyone is included, that the technology does not act in a way that is discriminatory, and that it does not infringe people's human rights, including children's rights. So the state is, you know, the key actor that is responsible. But under the um, UN guiding principles on human rights and business, you know, every country has agreed, has signed up to the international law that says business is also um, responsible for not infringing um, human rights, including children's rights. So yes, business must be responsible too. And as you say, that's hard because some of these companies are very large, very powerful, more powerful than many countries. I think it's also hard because some of the companies are very small and very fast and they they develop quickly. Uh, they don't know anything about the regulatory uh, structures and they just start collecting our data or causing problems. So both for the large ones and the small ones, it, it is a big challenge for the state. And that's why um, there are so many debates now all around the world on how to make technology more ethical, more rights respecting, uh, how to build uh, international cooperation frameworks. Um, is it enough? I don't know. I think um, some significant cases are being won in the courts. Uh, there have been some uh, significant fines against some of big tech and the public uh, trust is now changing and that also has its its effect because I think companies realize they they have to retain trust they have to retain their brand reputation and if they are known for um, surveilling children or causing them harm this is this is a disaster in the market as well as a disaster in for human rights and for children so I think um, this is a really interesting moment of change. I don't know who will win, um, but I um, I know which side to argue on. I know that you've researched for many years media regulation in Great Britain. So 
Uh, do you think the tradition of media regulation can catch these problems or do we need to think about a wider regulation, not only from the media perspective? Mm. Mm. That, that, uh, yeah, I think we definitely need to think about media regulation, uh, mm -hmm. but there are other, um, and we definitely need to make it apply You know, so the principle should be human rights apply online as offline. They apply in the digital world. How do we how do we do that? So firstly, we um, we make sure that the laws apply everywhere, uh, including online and that remedies apply online also. So that if something goes wrong, people can um, put things right. But what that's really saying is that institutions are subject to the law and organizations. So if um, if a data broker collects children's data through their lives and that's used to make a discriminatory decision, an unfair decision, let's say, about their future job, then it's not just the tech company or the data broker that must be subject to the law, but also the employer in the future, because the employer has used biased data or the university if the if the child doesn't get a university place because of something they did when they were a child the university must be so every organization now uses data and so every organization has a responsibility to use it transparently accountably without um uh, discrimination and in a way that offers remedy when something goes wrong and so it is it is the regulation of everything uh, yeah. in relation to the digital world yeah okay okay um, well, uh, you've also researched and worked a lot with education and schools. Um, mm. Here at NIPE, we work, uh, we also work in that field and in teacher's training. Um, there's a concept that is digital literacy that in the last like 15 years has changed a lot. It meant something mm. like 10 years ago and it means something different now. Uh, what do you think it entails nowadays? What, should a teacher, a school, a principal, the educational system uh, know about digital literacy and teach about digital literacy? As you say, there have been so many arguments and debates about the nature of digital literacy and they build on older debates even about media literacy and everyone has their favorite definition. I would say first, most practically to teachers, that whatever uh, students need to understand about technology to make it work well for them, that's digital literacy. If they need to understand the functionality, yes, but if they also need to make decisions about um, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, then it's also uh, information and evaluation. Uh, if they need to be actors in a digital world to create to code to write you know create their own digital spaces that's that's part of digital so whatever they need and uh, it includes of course um uh, knowledge about safety how to act in a digital world safely and responsibly uh, but sometimes that becomes the main thing and uh, i think many educators are so worried about safety and the problems of cyberbullying and grooming and pornography and so on that they um once they've learned the latest risks and become skilled to teach it it's almost taken up all the time and then we get an unbalanced approach in which children are left without the um the skills for citizenship in a digital world the schools for the skills for uh, creativity and participation and you know if we just make children safe they um well it will be good but it's not it's not enough so i think an expanded idea of of skills and i and i have sympathy with teachers i think it's a fantastically hard job because the technology is always changing the way in which society uses technology is always changing and so the the demands keep getting bigger and bigger and now for example people say let us teach children data literacy and i agree we should but you know who who really understands where our data goes who really understands the data ecology behind so you know the lawyers are arguing about this the technologists are arguing about this so how can the teachers have a, a a package of knowledge to give to the children they so you know ultimately i would say that literacy depends on legibility if the digital environment is orderly 
is transparent, is kind of well prepared, then yes, teachers should teach children to navigate and use it. But if that digital environment is chaotic and complex and opaque, often on purpose, um, then we have to regulate the digital environment before expecting teachers to solve all of the problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and here, um, do you think the, the pandemic uh, brought or will bring, we don't know if it's brought, will bring uh, deep changes towards digital literacy or, or just back to normal and, and mm. old problems? <laughs> I, I don't know. I hope they won't be back to normal because actually normal wasn't so good. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we do hope that we have learned some things in the pandemic that are beneficial. Um, one very simple thing I think we have learned is that children and young people value in-person engagement and interaction. They actually don't want to be always staring at their screen and never going out, which, you know, in the last 10 years, we were always being told young people, they just want to stare at their screen. No, they don't. And the pandemic really showed this. I think the pandemic also really showed that young people don't only want to learn through a screen. They want to be in class with their peers talking interacting with you know they're embodied they want to be properly um engaged uh, and that's much more stimulating and they say much preferable uh, so you know we've learned some good things i think about children mm -hmm. um, but we've also learned uh more negatively that during the pandemic there has been such a pressure to put the technology um out there and to rely on it that we have um uh, promoted technology which does not respect privacy, which does collect data in ways that people have no choice about, and in which a lot of companies have made money out of people's everyday real needs without people's needs being uh, very well met. And a lot of that is, um, yeah, not in children's best interests, but in uh, commercial interests. So mm -hmm. I think we, we also perhaps learned that at times of crisis and change, governments need to be extra careful to make sure that what the changes they develop really do respect children's rights. Mm -hmm. Well, just one last question that is um, uh, regarding ICT policies and practices, um, at least in Argentina and in many other countries in Latin America and post the pandemic education emergency policies, uh, there is some sort of relaunch of ICT policies, ICT integration policies, um, in many cases with an expectation of a deepening inequality in schools throughout technologies, in others to uh, bring the future into the schools and all those discourses relating uh, ICT with, with a future that we still don't know, but it's going to be digital. Um, here, I want to ask you, what would be your advice, both for policymakers and for teachers that are in everyday school practices mediated by different technologies, not only the ones that are provided by the schools, but also mobile phones, which everybody has now? So I think the starting place for uh, teachers and schools facing change and changes that they don't always understand or feel in control of is to make to have a kind of um, a reflection on the problem and a reflection that includes the students so very simply talk to the students dear children i face this challenge we have to change the classroom we have the new technology how should we you know to so to take a, an approach which is consultative which um, includes the children in the reflection on the challenge rather than trying to solve it and then impose the solution and to learn from what the children say, not because they know everything, not because they always have a superior knowledge, of course not, teachers know, know a lot, but because it is a shared problem and there are different perspectives. And we have to develop solutions which respect the perspectives of those who are involved so that they can feel engaged and they can take agency over the um, the next steps. So, so number one, um, engage the children and, and, and talk to them. And then perhaps number two, um, try to find ways forward that keep options open. I think um, educators often like to find a solution that they can kind of 
close down the questions and hang on to the answer. Um, but perhaps it's more about the process and the um, kind of ethics of working things out that is more important than saying, this is how we will use technology and it will get stuck here because that will always become out of date. Uh, so, um, and that makes it exciting. It becomes part of a, a kind of process of discovery about what education can be. Um, but the last thing I might say is, um, pay careful critical attention to the outcomes because there is so much hype we are being told uh, technology transforms education in this way or no it doesn't generally no it doesn't um so let's stay skeptical let's say a little bit distant um and not get uh, swept away in all the exaggeration okay okay well sonia thank you so much i don't know if you want to add anything uh this is the moment and if not, no, no I'm, I'm happy. It was a lovely conversation. And thank you so much for your great questions.